question I want to ask this morning and answer is, how can you and I overcome the battle of sin on the inside? And for that, turn to Romans chapter 7. For those of you who are visiting, we are going through the book of Romans verse by verse, and we are in chapter 7 as we look at how to win the battle over sin on the inside. Now remember, the theme of the book of Romans is how to be saved and how to grow. And Paul outlines that theme throughout the book of Romans. He first of all talks about condemnation. In chapters 1 through 3, he says we're all condemned by God because we're sinners by nature and by choice. Then he moves to the good news. He goes from condemnation to justification. And he says even though we're condemned by our sin, God has offered salvation to us by faith in Jesus Christ. And if we repent and trust in Christ, we can be justified, <clears throat> declared no longer guilty of sin. And then he goes from justification to sanctification in chapters 6 through 8. And then, of course, at the end of chapter 8, he's going to touch on the subject of glorification. We are on that section in chapters 6 through 8 on sanctification. Sanctification simply means that God sets us apart from sin at salvation, and he progressively makes us more like Jesus Christ. In fact, I went to the fair a couple weeks ago, and one of the things that they did there was they had this guy that took a chainsaw, maybe you've seen it before, and he took this piece of wood or several pieces of wood, and he had this image in his mind, and he took the chainsaw, and and he would cut the piece of wood according to the image that he saw. And this is one sample, Sasquatch, that he came up with, and there was a number of others. And you know, that's a picture of sanctification in the Bible. God has the image of Christ, and what he's doing is he's taking his chainsaw, his chisel, and he's forming us into the image of Christ. That is sanctification. Now remember, John last week looked at chapter 6 in this whole process of sanctification, and basically what chapter 6 said was the reigning monarch of sin has been dethroned. In other words, sin's power has been broken in your life at the moment of salvation. Even though sin is not going to go away completely till I get to heaven, its power has been broken, and now I have the power to say no to sin. That's the theme of chapter 6. But when we get to chapter 7, what Paul's going to share is the struggle that we all have. Even though sin as a reigning monarch has been dethroned in chapter 6, we still have a struggle with sin on a regular basis. And so what I want to give you this morning are seven principles on how you and I can win the battle of sin on the inside. As I said, we're never going to win it perfectly, but God wants us to walk in victory. Principle number one is this. If you and I are going to get victory over sin, we must remember we are under God's grace and not the law. And I have to warn you, this chapter is very, very complicated. He uses a lot of words, but notice what he says in verse 1, or do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, in other words, he's talking to Gentiles and Jews, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Now, this is an axiomatic statement. It's a self-evident truth that the law only applies to those who are living, Unless, of course, when it comes to voting laws, then the dead, you know, we, we understand that. <laughs> but listen, the law only applies to those who are living, right? Have you ever been to a funeral and watched a cop come into the funeral and take a series of parking tickets or speeding tickets and give it to the dead person in the casket? They don't do that. Why? Because we understand that when a person dies, they are free from the law. And if Paul's going to use a biblical illustration, beginning in verse 2, to illustrate what he just said in verse 1, for the married woman is bound by law to her husband as long as he is alive. In other words, if you're married, you're bound to your husband or your spouse as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. Notice, notice death frees them from the law. So then, verse 3, if while her husband is alive, she gives herself to another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress if she gives herself to another man. So to illustrate it in simple terms, I'm married to Laura Nimmer. If Laura Nimmer decides to leave me for another man, she has violated the law of God that says thou shalt not commit adultery. She is under that law. However, if Mike Nimmer dies and Laura Nimmer decides to remarry, 
She is no longer under the law of adultery. Why? Because my death freed her from being under the law. And what Paul says is, as Christians, you and I died with Christ, therefore we are free from the law. Notice what he says in verse 4. Therefore, on the basis of what he just said about marriage and divorce, therefore, brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in regard to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. In other words, you're not married to the law anymore, you are married to Christ, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For while we were in the flesh, in other words, when we were non-believers, whenever Paul uses that phrase, in the flesh, he's talking about being a non-believer. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were brought to light by the law were at work in the parts of our body to bear fruit for death. In other words, when you were a non-believer, what the law did was it stimulated sin. He says in verse 6, but now we have, and notice what he says here, very critical, we have been released from the law, having died to that which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. And so here's his point. If you and I want to get victory over sin on the inside and win that battle, we have to understand that we are no longer under the law, but under God's grace. Notice the picture up on the screen. This will visualize it for you. The Bible says prior to salvation, you were under the law. You were under the law's condemnation because you could not keep the law perfectly. In fact, Galatians 3 says you and I were under a curse. But what happened is Jesus bore our curse on the cross, and the Bible says the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were crucified with Christ. In other words, God identified you with Jesus so that when Christ died, you died. And since Christ bore your curse, the curse has been paid. Because you died in Christ. Then the Bible says you were buried with Christ. Then you were raised with Christ. Now is a new creation to walk in newness of life. And so when the Bible says we're no longer under the law, what that means is this. We are no longer under the curse of the law. That does not mean we are no longer under the moral obligations of the law. Because it says in Romans 8, 5 that God has given us the spirit to fulfill the requirements of the law. Not being under the law is not a license for sin. What it means is I'm under grace. Notice the next slide up here. You will notice the Bible says we are under the law prior to salvation. All non-believers are under the law, and when they die without Jesus Christ, they will be judged by whether or not they kept the law. They're under guilt. They're under condemnation. But at salvation, when I die with Christ, what happens is now I'm under the sphere or the canopy of God's grace. All believers are under God's grace, which includes forgiveness, mercy, power, et cetera, et cetera. And so the point is this, death releases us from the law. And since I died in Christ, therefore I'm no longer under the condemnation of the law, but I walk under the canopy of God's grace. You say, well, how does that help me in combating sin? Simply this, if I know that I'm under God's grace and I'm not under the bony finger of the law, what that does is it motivates me to live for God. Knowing that I'm under God's grace simply means this, the more I sin, the more grace I get. Now, that's not a license for sin. Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 6, God forbid that I take God's grace and I abuse it. But nevertheless, no matter how many times I sin, I know I'm under God's grace and not the law. The law condemns. The law basically points out my sin and tears me down, whereas God's grace builds me up and it motivates me to not want to live a life of sin. Why? Because I'm under God's grace. My senior year, I got in trouble. I was a Christian. We went grad night to Disney World, and they took a bus up there, and I was with all my friends. Long story short, I ended up getting intoxicated with all my friends, and I knew I shouldn't have done it, but I got in the flesh. And so we got caught when we were at Disney World, and the principal said to the dean of students who I was friends with, he was my Bible teacher, when you get back to school Monday, I went to a Christian high school, he says, you need to deal with this. So one by one on Monday, we got called in the office. And I remember going in there, and I was shameful, and I told my dean of students, who was a friend of mine, his name was Lyle Green, I said, Lyle, I said, the thing that bothers me the most is that I hurt my testimony. He said, Mike, you're under God's grace. He said, move on, this happens, you're forgiven if you've confessed it. He said, move on. Well, I talked to a lady a couple days later who basically, actually, I dated her daughter. And uh, when I was talking to her, 
she was not like my teacher. She had her bony finger at me, and she said, did you know what you did, Mike? She said, did you know what you did? That hurt your testimony. You may not get your football award because of this. You may not graduate. They may not give you your diploma. She was the law, pointing out what I had done wrong, condemning me. My Bible teacher was grace. And see, the Bible says we have been moved from God's law under its condemnation, under its curse, to God's grace. And you know what that does? It motivates me and empowers me to live for Christ and not to sin. And when I do blow it, and we're going to blow it, we could come to God over and over. You say, but Mike, sometimes I think the same thoughts, I struggle with the same sins, I have besetting sins. You know what? Keep coming to God, because you know what Satan wants to do? He wants to shame you so that you don't want to come to God, and you don't want to seek his grace. Don't live by your feelings. Live by the truth of God's word. I am under grace and no longer the law. Why? Because I died with Christ, I was buried with Christ, I've been raised with Christ, therefore I am released from the law. Not to be a lawless Christian, but simply to walk in God's grace. Well, there's a second principle that you and I must employ if we're going to get victory over sin, and that is this. We must depend upon the Spirit's power. Notice what it says in verse 5. For while we were in the flesh, while we were unsaved, the sinful passions which were brought to light by the law... We're at work in the parts of our body to bear fruit for death. In other words, when we were not saved, the law stimulated sin in our life. And listen, we had no power to overcome sin because we were under the condemnation of the law. But notice the transition in verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that, here it is, we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The second principle, if you and I are going to win the battle in, is this. We must depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit. He says we depend upon the newness of the Spirit rather than the letter of the law. See, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came on people for certain tasks and would leave them. It was all external. And what happens in the New Covenant, based on Ezekiel and Jeremiah, is God promised that he would give us his spirit to live on the inside of us. And watch this, God would write his laws in our heart and give us a new motivation and a new power. And that's why you and I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis if we're going to mortify the deeds of the flesh. You will not get victory over sin if you're not a spirit-filled Christian. And let me say this, just because you come to church on a regular basis doesn't mean that you're a spirit-filled Christian. Listen, you're either controlled by the Spirit or you're controlled by the flesh at any given moment. To be controlled by the Spirit simply means that the Holy Spirit is dictating what you do. It's not necessarily mystical. I remember again when I was in high school, I got saved in ninth grade. And I told my coach in his office that I needed to become a born-again Christian. And of course, he fell out of his chair. He led me in the sinner's prayer. And for about a year, nothing really was transformative in my life. I knew I had trusted in Christ, but then the girl that I was dating said, she went to a Presbyterian church, she said, Mike, we're going to Disney World, and she said, I want to invite you to come. So I went, obviously I wanted to be around her, and so they separated the boys from the girls, we stayed on one side of the hotel, they stayed on the other, and I remember I was out seeing her, and when I came back into the hotel room, the three guys that I roomed with who were committed Christians, they were doing a Bible study. And they said, Mike, why don't you sit down and do a Bible study with us? Well, I was nervous. I didn't know these guys. I was insecure. And so I remember they were doing the Bible study. I can't tell you what they were talking about. And all of a sudden, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I didn't speak in tongues. But listen, I felt the Holy Spirit baptize me. And I remember thinking to myself, what the heck is going on here? Listen, from that point on, the whole trajectory of my life changed. When I got back on the bus to go back to Miami, I said, Lord, I want to obey you. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. Bring somebody to me to disciple me. You know what I experienced? I experienced the filling of the Holy Spirit. Some would call it the baptism. Some call it the filling, whatever you want to call it. I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And you know what? It changed the trajectory of my life. And listen, now I had victory, not perfect victory, But everything changed. In that year after I accepted Christ, nothing was happening. And then all of a sudden, the power of the Holy Spirit enabled me to mortify the deeds of the flesh. You say, Mike, how do I get the power of the Holy Spirit? Listen, it's not a thing that you plug into like an outlet. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, 
you got to follow Jesus Christ. If you got one foot in the world and one foot in Christianity and you're a double-minded person, you're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You got to follow Christ, not perfectly, and then you got to saturate yourself with the Word of God. You got to be in fellowship and you got to deal with sin on a regular basis. There's no way you and I will get victory over the sin on the inside if we are not spirit controlled Christians. And listen, a majority of the American church is not spirit filled. That's why we're not making an impact in the world. Because coming to church doesn't make you a spirit filled Christian. Well, there's a third principle if you and I are going to get victory over sin, and that is this we must serve God. We must serve God. Notice, if you will, verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that which we are bound. Notice what he says here, so that we may what? Serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. If you want victory over sin, you know what the Bible says? Get out of yourself. Stop focusing in on you all the time. One of the marks of a mature Christian is it's not just about me. Lord, my family, my kids, my entertainment, my fun. Listen, there's nothing wrong with focusing in on you to a certain degree. We all do that. God wired us that way. But listen, if you want to get victory over sin, get out of yourself and begin to serve other people. Now listen, serving others doesn't mean that you're going to overcome sin fully and finally, but let me tell you what it does. When you focus in on God and other people, you know what it does? It breaks the power of sin in your life. Show me Christians all the time that are self-focused. A lot of times they're not serving other people, and this is the reason why they're caught up in their own bondages. Now, again, you could serve others and still battle depression, still battle anxiety, still battle lust, still battle pride, whatever it is you struggle with. But I can tell you this, when you focus on other people and you use the gifts that God has given you and you serve other people, I'm here to tell you that that helps you overcome sin. My wife, before we had our three daughters, we have Caitlin, Ashley, and Amber. Before we had Caitlin, Laura was pregnant and she ended up miscarrying. And she went through a grieving process, as any woman would, and she was working at a drug rehab as a counselor uh, from a biblical perspective. And I don't know all the details, but Laura told me she went through a lot of grief after the miscarriage. And she said one of the head counselors there told her that you need to get out of yourself and stop focusing in on your pain and your sorrow and continue to focus on these women and serve them. And listen, some of you, if you want to get help with what you're struggling with, listen, I'm telling you this works. If you want to get out of your self-pity, if you want to get out of some of the things you're struggling with, roll up your sleeves and get involved in serving other people. Find your niche. We all have a niche. We all have gifts. We all have a different personality. But listen, God will use you if you're willing to serve others. But listen, a lot of Christians won't do this. You know why? Because they just content coming to church. They don't want to get involved. But listen, Jesus called you to get involved because you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, you couldn't, you couldn't twist my arm in college to serve God. I remember praying to God on my face saying, God, I want to do something for you. Open the door. And I remember the next Sunday I went to church. I wasn't a pastor at the time. A guy walked up to me out of the blue and he said, Mike, I've been praying about someone who would teach the junior high kids and you're the only person that God put on my heart. And I went, me, junior high kids? But you know what? That was my induction into serving God. I was willing and available to be used by God. There is a fourth principle that you and I must employ if we are going to get victory over sin, and that is this. Allow God's word to expose your sin. Allow God's word to expose your sin. Now, I've never been to AA, but from what I understand, when you go to AA, one of the first principles that they espouse is this. If you're going to get victory over alcohol, you have to first admit that you have a what? A problem. That's the first step. You got to expose it. You got to bring it into the light. And so what Paul is going to describe here is his pre-conversion. What was going on on the inside before he got saved? And what he says basically is this, God's word exposed his sin so that he saw his need for Christ and he could get saved. Notice what he says in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? He said we were dead to the law, we were free from the law. And so someone's going to ask the question, does that mean that the law is bad? And he says, may it never be. On the contrary, here it is, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. 
For I would not have known about coveting if the law had said, you shall not covet. In other words, the purpose of the law, it's not a bad thing. Paul says the law's purpose is to expose sin. And he said, I wouldn't have known about coveting if the law said you should not covet. I went to the fair, as I said, a couple of weeks ago, and they did something different. I remember in years past, what they would do is when you'd get in, they would take a stamp and they would put it on your hand. I think they do this at Disney World and other theme parks. And if you go in, they have you put your hand under this fluorescent light. And what that fluorescent light does is it exposes the stamp so they know that you paid. Well, that's what he says the law did. The law was like that fluorescent light. It was like a mirror. What it did was it exposed his sin, and it revealed to him that he was a coveter. But notice verse 8, but sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. In other words, sin used God's commandment to make Paul realize that he was a sinner. He says, for apart from the law, sin is dead. Now, he doesn't mean the law doesn't exist at that point. It doesn't condemn us, but it's like a barren hibernation. The law is dormant. And what happened is when he was exposed to the law, it revealed his sin. He says in verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law. Paul was a Pharisee. He thought he was good enough to get to heaven. But when the commandment came in, sin became alive and I died. In other words, the law exposed his sin, and he realized that he was a sinner, and he was doomed to God's judgment. Verse 10, and this commandment, which was to result in life, proved death, proved to result in death for me. In other words, Paul thought that the commandments would save him because he was a self-righteous Pharisee, but then he realized that the law, which he thought would save him, ended up killing him. It killed his self-righteousness. He realized that he could not keep the law perfectly in order to get into heaven. He says in verse 11, for sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, it killed me. So then, verse 12, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. He says there's nothing problem with the law. The law is good. The law was simply the tool that God used to expose my sin as a sinner and my need for Jesus Christ. It's like if I have cancer and I go into surgery, I don't say the scalpel is the bad thing, do I? The scalpel is the means that the surgeon uses to cut out the cancer. Well, the law is the scalpel. The problem is not with the scalpel. The problem is with the cancer. And so Paul says, look, the law is not a bad thing. The law is a good thing. What it does is it points out our sin so that we see our need for Jesus Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior. He says in verse 13, therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would be utterly sinful. In other words, what Paul is saying is, look, the law exposed my sin prior to salvation. I thought I was good enough to get into heaven, Paul says. I was a self-righteous Pharisee, and then when I realized that I couldn't keep God's commandment, the law killed me, and I realized my need for Jesus Christ. And listen, it's the same as a believer. It's not just prior to salvation that we see our need for Jesus Christ and allow God's word to expose our sin. It's after salvation as well that the word of God also exposes our sins so that we can be sanctified and grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so if you want to get victory over sin, the fourth thing you must do is expose your sin to the word of God. You say, Mike, that seems counterintuitive. No, it's not. Because the Bible says this, when you bring your sin to light and you allow God's word to reprove you, what it does is it allows you to deal with the sin in your life. That's why it's very, very critical that you and I are in the Word of God on a regular basis. We're exposing ourselves to Scripture because what the Scripture does is it exposes my sin so that I can deal with it, I can confess it, and I can repent of it. And listen, I do a lot of confession. I don't know about you, but I'm confessing my sin on a daily basis. It's almost like breathing. You confess your sin regularly. But listen, if you're not in the Word of God and allowing it to expose your sin not only for salvation, but after salvation, watch this, you're going to justify sin in your life. You're going to become hardened to sin. You're going to rationalize your sin. You're going to be insensitive to the Holy Spirit and not deal with sin in your life. I don't like going to the dentist, do you? But I go twice a year. 
and I go to get cleanings. I sure love the cleaning. And you know, I went a couple months ago, and as I'm sitting there, she took this little um, lamp and she put it on her head. I said, are we going digging for coal or what? And she said, well, what this does is she said, when I get into your mouth, which by the way, I don't know why anybody would want to get into that field, but God bless you if you're a dentist. She said, what this does is it magnifies the calculus on your teeth so that I could go in there and I can clean it out. She said, with the, with the naked eye, I can't see it as well, but this magnifies it so I can scrape all the plaque out of there. Listen, that's what God's Word does. It exposes our sin so that the Spirit can use the Word of God to scrape the plaque of sin in our life. That's what the Word of God does, but we got to expose ourselves to the Scripture on a regular basis, and that's why we must meditate on the Word of God. Paul says in Romans 7, verse 22, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. Notice Paul, in his new man, hungered for the Word of God. He thirsted for the Word of God. And listen, there are times where I don't hunger for the Word of God like I should. But you know what? I discipline myself to get into the Word. I don't wait for the feeling to come. I act on truth rather than feeling. And listen, when I'm in the Word, you know what it does? It blesses me. And I could promise you this. If you're not regularly in Scripture, you are going to justify sin in your life. And so you want victory over sin? Expose yourself to the Word of God. Not just reading the Word of God, listening to preachers on the radio, on television, reading godly books. But here's the problem. Some of you are more focused on Facebook than you are the Father's book. Some of us spend too much time in social media, and you know what? It's an addiction. I find myself reading a book, sometimes reading the Bible, and every five minutes I go to my cell phone. I go, put that thing down, you idiot. We all struggle. There's a fifth way that you and I can overcome and win the battle of sin in our life, and that is this. Know the source of your spiritual battles. In other words, where is your spiritual battle coming from? If you know the source, it's going to better able to help you deal with it. Now, we know two sources is the world and the devil. We know it says in 1 John 2 that we're not to love the world nor the things in the world because from the world comes the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we know that Satan is called the tempter. So we all know that. But what Paul is going to describe here in Romans is another source of where our sin comes from, and it's this. It is the old man and the new man. There is a battle going on on the inside of us. Now watch this. At salvation, as I mentioned to you, the old man was dethroned. The reigning monarch of sin was dethroned. Christ is now on the throne of your life. But even though the old man's power has been broken, the old man will rear his ugly head. And so you got this battle going on between the old Adamic nature, the sin principle that you inherited from Adam, and then you got the new man, which is the new creation. And what happens is you got this civil war on the inside going on. Oh, I know I need to eat healthy. And I've been doing good all day, and then I get invited out to Applebee's and everybody's eating wings. No salad, no wings, no salad, no wings. That's my battle. Eating healthy. Notice Paul the schizophrenic here. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. In other words, it's from the spirit, it's good. But I am of the flesh, sold into the bondage of sin. He says, for what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do. That would be the new man. The new man doesn't want to do certain things, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. That would be the old man. But if I do, verse 16, the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. That would be the new man, confessing that God's law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. That would be the old man. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present, that would be the new man, but the doing of the good is not. Lord, I don't want to use profanity anymore, but sometimes I find myself using profanity. Lord, I know I should trust you in this difficult circumstance in my life, but God, I struggle with worry and I struggle with doubt. He says, verse 19, for the good that I want, that is the new man, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. That is the old man. Listen, we all have good intent, 
we all have a redeemed heart that wants to honor God, that wants to do the will of God, and we say, God, you know my heart. And yet we still battle the old man and we fail. We all have those besetting sins. He says in verse 20, but if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin dwells in me. In other words, it's the old man. I find the principle, verse 21, that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. In my inner man, I love God's law. I want to keep God's law. But notice verse 23, but I see a different law in the members of my body. Here it is, circle it, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? You ever said that before? Lord, I am such a wretched person. Lord, I have this redeemed self that wants to honor you, but on the other hand, I have this self that in a moment's notice, I could cut someone to shreds with my words. He says, who's going to set me free from this? Thanks be to God, verse 25, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he ends this battle. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. That would be your new redeemed self. But on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin, that is the old man. And so Paul says, look, I have this continual tug of war between the old man and the new man. And listen, if you're going to get victory over sin, you got to know the source of the battle. The battle is coming from the world. It's coming from the devil. But it's also coming from this civil war going on on the inside between the old man and the new man. The new man is perfect. The old man, even though its power has been broken, even though sin's principle has been crushed, it rears its ugly head. And so I have this battle going on on a regular basis just like you. And you know what? Again, I say it. If you're not battling, you're not growing. I heard Joel Osteen one time say, you know, the Christian life is easy. I thought, what is he smoking? (laughs) Listen, it isn't easy. It is a battle. But we can have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I was talking to my former pastor's wife. She's in her 70s. We traveled this week to go to Asheville. And on the way, I called her on the phone. She lives in Tennessee. We were talking about the beauties and the glories of Tennessee. And she said, Mike, I live in Middle Tennessee. You have Eastern Tennessee, Western Tennessee. Western Tennessee is where Memphis is, Eastern Tennessee, Knoxville. She's in Middle Tennessee. Sorry, yeah, Memphis is on the west. She said, I'm in Middle Tennessee. And then she shared some history with me. She didn't know all the details. But she said, did you know during the Civil War, it was either east or west, one of them joined the Confederate, and one of them joined the Union. And therefore, Western Tennessee and Eastern Tennessee did not get along with each other. And so you know what they did? They fought one another in the middle, called Middle Tennessee. Western and Eastern fought one another. Do you realize that you and I are Middle Tennessee? We got the East and the West going on on the inside of us, and it is a titanic struggle. Some days, by the way, are worse than others. You know what makes it worse in the battle? When you're going through a trial in your life, you know what trials do? They bring, out the, they bring out the battle, the struggle, and bold relief when you're going through a difficult time in your life. When the bottom drops out and the roof caves in, that's when you notice the battle more. Seeing things. I've been driving on the highway. I see a billboard. Bam, thoughts come into my mind. I've been on my knees praying, and I get thoughts that are just wicked and ugly. We all have that battle. So if you want to overcome, you got to know the source of the battle, where it comes from. There's a sixth principle as we wind down, and that is this. If you want to overcome sin, control your thought life. Notice, if you will, verses 21 through 23. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body. Now, I want you to know this. Waging war, say it out loud, against the law of my what? mind. There's where the battle happens. You want to win the battle? You got to win it in your thought life. And listen, that is where we get defeated or we get victorious. And that's why, again, it's so critical you're in the Word of God. Because every day, I get a plethora of thoughts in my mind. As soon as I wake up, even in my dreams, I have good dreams and I have raunchy dreams. As soon as you wake up, you got stuff going on in your mind. 
You'll hear something, you'll see something, you'll smell something, it'll trigger thoughts. And listen, when I talk about thoughts, I'm talking about intentions, attitudes, what's going on in your mind. And if you and I, the Bible says, want to get victory over sin, we got to take every thought captive to obedience to Jesus Christ. Now, there's a game that I've played. Somebody told me in the first service, what's the name of it? You'll notice it up on the screen. You guys notice this. What's the name of this game? What is it called? Whack-a-mole. You guys remember this game? You know, you're sitting there with your mallet, and what happens is this little head comes up and you hit it. And then when you put that one down, another head comes up, you hit it. And then a bunch of them come up and you're going, bop, 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 bop. You know, that's exactly how we have to deal with our thought life. Paul says this battle between the old man and new man is won in our thought life. Are we setting our mind on things above? Are we thinking godly? And when the bad thoughts come in, we hit them and we put them out. But you know what? Sometimes we don't. We dwell on the worry. We dwell on the lust. We dwell on the fear. We dwell on the addiction. We dwell on things. And that's why you got to watch your ear gate and your eye gate because what you let in will stimulate sin in your life. One more principle as we close. Focus on your future glorification in heaven. Notice what he says in verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? And then he says in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now listen, Jesus' death and resurrection gives us the victory the power of the Holy Spirit, but I believe here he's talking about our future glorification. When you and I get to heaven, the the battle is going to be over. There is no longer going to be a struggle. Listen, the new you is perfect. God doesn't have to do anything. When you die, the new you goes into the presence of God, and what happens is your body's in the ground or it's cremated. What God's going to do, he's going to raise your body Unite it with your soul, which is already in heaven, and you're going to be perfect body and soul. That's glorification. That's why Paul says in spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, he says, in the battle, when you put on the armor, he says, put on the helmet of the hope of salvation. What is the helmet? It's the hope of my future salvation. Romans 8 calls it the redemption of the body. Because listen, the body is the beachhead for sin. It's not just my old man. It's also my body with all of its bents, all of its desires, all of its cravings. All of that is going to be eliminated when I get to heaven. The battle will be over. And listen, that'll be one of the joys of heaven. We will have victory when we get up there. I put a quote on Facebook this week by John Owen, one of the Puritans. Great quote. He said this. The difference between an unbeliever and a believer is that an unbeliever clings to his sin willingly, while sin clings to the believer against his will. One lady responded to my post, and she said this, quote, I look forward to the day when I'm forever free from having to battle with the old man, end quote. How about you? Listen, that's why we keep our focus on the finish line. You know why we get discouraged? Because we all get discouraged in our battle with sin and we get on our face and we say, God, I'm so wretched, Lord. How do you even deal with me? How do you even love me? And you know what God says? You're no longer under the law. You're under the sphere of my what? Grace. And listen, Mike, the more you sin, the more grace I'm going to give you. It's not a license to sin, but you know what that does? It motivates me to walk in victory and I keep my eyes on the finish line knowing that I'm moving towards heaven and there's coming a day of accountability. Therefore, the battle is gonna be over one day and you know what? That helps me to persevere when I feel like throwing in the towel because you can get so discouraged with sin you wanna throw in the towel. You wanna quit. So Paul says in Romans 7, there's a struggle going on. Romans 6 I've been freed from sin. Sin's power has been broken. Romans 7 says, even though its power has been broken, you're still going to struggle. How do we win the battle on the inside over sin? Seven principles. Let's review them. Number one, remember that you are under God's grace and not what? The law. Secondly, depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, serve God. 
Number four, allow God's word to expose your sin. Number five, know the source of your spiritual battles. They come from the old man and the new man warring. Number six, control your thought life. And number seven, focus in on your future glorification in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for reminding us of the great truths of Romans chapter 7. And Father, Paul was a mature Christian, and yet he struggled. And Father, I pray that all of us here who are struggling, and we do on a daily basis, I pray that we would not give up in the battle. There are some of you this morning that have a stronghold in your life. You've allowed sin to reign in your mortal body that you're obeying its lusts. What is it for you? Is it materialism? Is it pornography? Is it alcohol or drugs? Maybe it's bitterness and unforgiveness. You will not let it go. I want to encourage you this morning to let it go, to give Jesus Christ the rightful place in your life on the throne and to confess your sin and forsake it. And if you're discouraged this morning, maybe because of the battle, hang in there. Be encouraged. You're under God's grace, not under his law. Walk in that victory. Walk in that grace, knowing that you are under God's canopy of mercy. Father, we thank you this morning for all that you do for us. Thank you that we died in Christ. We've been buried. We're raised to newness of life. Therefore, we have victory over sin, and when we blow it time and time again, we thank you, God, that your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Father, we worship you and we praise you. In Jesus' name.